Really excited to be here with my friend, Mark Walsh. He is the founder of the Embodiment Conference. A lot of you have probably heard of it. It had half a million participants, um, you know, like a thousand teachers, Mark. Is that right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's still a little bit, it's over a year ago now, but it's still a little bit epic. It's still, still go, it, you, you've had, you had a replay of it recently. People can, you know, join, you know, buy it now. It's, it's fantastic, of course. Thank you for having me do a session in there too. And uh, Mark, you're doing also the Certificate of Embodiment Coaching for, for any of you uh, listening who are coaches and want to really learn the pro embodiment skills for helping your clients and yourself. Um, and Mark, you have a podcast called The Embodiment Podcast. Embodiment everything, man. Embodiment <laughs> working, but I've got embodiment <laughs> underpants. Um, <laughs> That's coming next. So, clocks, so we we wanted to. Uh, I wanted to get together with you because um, we wanted to talk about self care because that's been something that has uh, you, you've you've. Um, it's been a big lesson for you in the past year. I mean, you have been yeah. you've you've been going full full on for at least a year after, especially after the conference. Essentially, your audience completely just you know, blew up and uh, you had all these um, uh, people who were looking to learn from you. You created all these courses, these in-depth courses and short ones as well. And um, anyway, you, you, you basically had managed a lot in the past year. Yeah. I mean, my life changed radically. You know, I started getting recognized in the street and when I went to yoga and stuff. And um, also I became accidentally became the sort of CEO of a tech company doing online learning which we've always always done a bit of I mean I've you know my bread and butter's always been training coaches to work with the body you know that's what I've written books on and you know do courses on and all of a sudden I was a manager as well and it took me a while to go oh, hang on this isn't really my life purpose and I was you know running a tech company I had to learn about marketing and you know I, I was always into your stuff and Pat and other people and well, not many people just a few people who do you know really ethically aligned marketing and I've been teaching that a bit to my students you know as well but I had to really up my game in learning about online business and um you know we, we share some friends now people who are big in that world and into that i had to learn a lot but also just personally you know there's, there's a difference in i've always i mean i got sober 15 years ago and at that point i decided i wanted to live not die and i decided i want to make something of my life i wanted to you know leave something behind i wanted to give a contribution lots of ways to say it and I'd always done martial arts, you know, even when I was drinking and I, I kind of um, had bad combination. Um, and I, but I'd always found like the embodiment world, this is the idea of the body being more than a brain taxi, the body being part of who we are. Love that stuff, turn it into business, always work hard. Um, particularly, I think this is undersaid actually, when you love something, that's sometimes actually a recipe for disaster. You know, I sometimes joke, the muse does not care about you. Like, you know, being inspired, you're running a lot, you know, that spiritual energy, you're running a lot through the veins. And then I'd always done that for years. And, I, I, you know, I meditate, I do yoga, I dance. I mean, my schedule is you know, full of embodiment stuff as well as being a manager. Like my day is kind of like eight, hours, eight, nine hours a day, like a normal manager and three hours a day. You know, today, meditation, went to the gym, got a, a sistema martial arts class planned for us for this. That's a normal day for me. And I found I was almost enabling myself with these practices. So it's like, imagine like an athlete who sprains their ankle on the pitch and they're, you know, they're playing on a baseball or football or whatever. And then, the, you know, the coach kind of sprays on the mindfulness and says, get back on the pitch, you know? And that was me. And I, I almost was self-abusing because I had this life purpose and I knew all these practices. And naturally, I'm kind of a yang guy, you know? and I was getting a bit older. I think that was a part of it. You know, I hit 40, 42 now. I know I look younger, thanks for saying. And I, I kind of realized like, a, like something more fundamental needed to shift. And that's, that's where I've been at recently. And um, yeah, profound difference in shifting from using wisdom and practices to cope to really kind of like, pulling the rug out from the kind of self-abuse system. Wow. Yeah, dude. Um, so much to talk about here. I, I, a couple of things I wanted to, to kind of highlight and have you, have you go into a bit. One, just first of all, I know you, you say this on your, on your podcast as a tagline, the body is not just a taxi for the brain, right? I just want you to just pause for a second and, and 
for, for, for those who are listening, who aren't studying embodiment every day, like you are, what is, what does that really mean? Because, because, I mean, that is the, that is the sort of uh, how we, most of us have grown up is like, well, the body, you know, you really add value. I mean, unless you're an athlete or a musician, you add value to the world with, with the brain. And so you just have to like, make sure the brain stays alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, I mean, that phrase, I should credit Francis Bryce, another embodiment teacher, um, that phrase. And, you know, a friend of mine, who's a lecturer at a university. I grew up with him as a school kid, but now he's a lecturer. And he said, you know, my body just gets me from one lecture to another. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, he's at university and this is our model for, for, for learning. Um, so I thought it was pretty profound, but you know, he has profound back problems. Uh, and he has certain emotional problems. Uh, he has certain other problems, not just health problems, but like in terms of his leadership or whatever, he doesn't mm. have a starting place with that because you can't think your way out of most problems. You know, like reading books and things yeah. doesn't yeah. solve the problem. Right? You must see this with your students. Like you teach them marketing, they read the right books, but do they implement it? Right. Right. And yeah. it's like, why aren't people implementing it? We all know like health, let's just say health, right? We all know we should do some exercise and get a good night's sleep, and maybe meditate. And, Maybe not eat too many McDonald's or whatever, you know, but we don't do it. And why not? Because we have habits that in learning is embodied. And even when it looks like our, learn, you know, our contribution is coming from my head, that's only a part of it. Like any creative person, it's the whole being that's involved. You know, any leader, it's their emotional intelligence, almost certainly more than their cognitive intelligence that's inspiring people. And also just from a basic point of view, like, as an embodiment teacher, I study self-regulation. We just did a free event on, on self-regulation. But, uh, you know, there's a wider world. There's a cultural embodiment. And you're in a certain milieu. And then you have a certain heritage. Like, we, you know, we come from different groups, George, that have a certain uh, trauma inheritance, perhaps, as well. Um, that affects how we react to kind of authoritarian policies and things happening in the world. Co-regulation has just been absolutely shot through the last two years. You know, I'm just seeing people who are drained and tired in my workshop, exhausted. Yeah, you know, everybody has a road rage all the time now. Uh, you know, the equivalent of road rage, there needs to be a, a name for it, like COVID rage or something. You know, like people are just irritable because they're, they're not getting the co-regulation. Um, and we're in a world of technology. I just, <laughs> just got my, uh, this is funny. I got asked to speak at um, an event from a major technology company. I won't say which one, but, um, um, you know, it, the founder rhymes with uh, Jill Rates. And, um, I, and I said, sure, I'll speak at it, but I'm, I'm going to say technology is a very mixed blessing when it comes to our well-being and how, you know, we can dissociate spending so much time on technology. And actually, maybe people are motivated for us to do that. And, they're, you know, they want us to be uh, attention, to be shot and online. And, you know, they, they uninvited me pretty quick because they weren't ready to, to really hear that. But it's there is a wider context of disembodiment in the world. And while I often return my students to their personal practices, we should also look at community. You know, I like to hang out with other embodiment people, right? We spent the day yesterday hiking with another embodiment teacher. Nature, you know, where we are matters. Like you're in California, right? We're just talking about being in Portugal or Madeira, where I am now, which is a Portuguese island. You know, I'm more the person I want to be in Madeira than when I'm in Moscow. Now, I love Moscow, I've worked there a lot, but it's an intense place. And it's a very brutalized place in many ways. You know, I was, um, last time I was in Moscow, I was staying in an apartment, I could see the KGB building from where I was staying. So it's not called something else now, but it's, it's still the same. And, you know, the, the place we are, whether that be the physical environment, the cultural environment, the historical environment, makes a huge difference to our embodiment. These are all layers of embodiment, and none of these can be removed from hey, maybe you get an app and do some meditation, right? Yeah, yeah. The bigger picture. So when you're this kind of corner you've turned about mm. um, self-care and, you know, how you used to use it as like, a, like an occasional tool or like a tool to get more done. I mean, now, how are you seeing it now? <laughs> you know, I just started noticing it was easier for me to get to bed on time and I'm enjoying weightlifting at the moment. I mix my practices up and it's something you know, I dance as well at the moment. There's no thing that's easier to eat better food. Yeah. And these things will support each other, of course. If you sleep better, you have more willpower. If you eat better, you have more you know, energy, whatever. It's holistic, it's, it's, yeah. It's virtuous. Yeah, it's a virtuous circle. So that's part of it. And it's partly the place I'm in. It's partly that I see 
that I'm returning more to my life purpose of training teachers and, you know, sort of scaling down some of the tech stuff in the company. And, you know, like I, I just spoke to my coach a few months back and he's like, well, how much money do you need? And I went, well, you know, if I'm on 100K a year, that's just plenty. You know, it's really in Portugal. Like, that's just a lot of money. Like, I don't, like, beyond that, I mean, what am I going to do? Buy a Ferrari, crash it, kill myself, and like, get a new drug habit? I don't know, you know? Like, what do, what do I need, you know? Like, um, um, other than a slightly expensive Ukrainian wife who I do adore, actually, it's, um, it's, I don't have that many expenses. So it's, it's, I kind of realized, like, what is this for? And I, I'd always thought myself as quite an alternative person, quite counterculture. You know, I thought I'd seen through that. I'd been a live-in martial arts student. I've worked in war zones. I've done a lot of volunteering with kids and slums and this kind of cool stuff. And I thought, like, hey, I'm not impacted by mainstream values, but they hook you. And whether it's, you know, a little bit of fame, a little bit of power, a little bit of money, came with the embodiment conference, I had to unhook myself from it. Interesting, I've been thinking, how did I, because you can't separate life purpose from embodiment, from well-being, you know, you know environment, all these things. I've been trying to think how I did it recently because I want to help my students with it, right? Because what I know this is when I coach people, like one thing I'm really good at, and my whole company is actually all the coaches, a bunch of us, is helping people establish practices because that's what leads to change is practice, not one-offs. And we're pretty good at that. And we've got all these tricks, like on our coaching courses, we'll have alarms, reminders, and peer groups, and we sort of spread the work out, we use all the atomic habit stuff. And, you know, it's really intelligently done. And it works pretty well. But what I realized is the more fundamental shift in terms of like really getting, it's hard not to be cheesy with this stuff, but like, I'm not going to say I deserve it because I don't like that, that word. Like one of my students talks like your right to be. I quite like that, but I need to think right is the right word. It's like really grokking, really on an embodied level, getting like, I want to be well and I'm not willing to brutalize myself. In my case, with overwork, with someone else, it might be drugs, alcohol, or whatever. Like, and I, I had one level of that when I got sober, like, hey, I want to live, you know? And I've gone from I want to live and survive, which I've been surviving and using my practices every day to help me with that. But to, you know, I actually want to be well. And even if I'm going to work a, like a you know, 12 hour day today, that's not sustainable. That doesn't feel good. And as the embodiment person, I'm quite tuned into that. But I don't think it was like one big breakthrough. I think it was just years of practices like meta meditation, you know, wishing myself well, tuning into myself till it became too obvious not to be well. It became too, it would be like hitting myself in the face. It just seemed silly, you know. Um, and the other thing I think was just good relationships, like good wife, good therapist, good colleagues good friends, you know, hanging out with people like you and other people we share in common that just go, yeah, like, it's like we're all a bit stupid when it comes to self-love. And I think our sort of friends and partners and, you know, whoever have to kind of love us, like, fully until we can do that to ourselves. You know, and they sort of show us how it's done. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. There's, it's true. And, and, you know, kind of what you said earlier about leadership being more about the emotional intelligence um yeah it is the same thing here it's like the people around us um they have they rub off on us not necessarily what they say but well it's like you said the co-regulation and it's the the sort of the energy kind of all influences us and i still remember you know on the leadership thing uh, the people i remember as teachers fondly um or you know same thing you know on the other side not fondly um, it's all, it was all, it was all the emotional stuff, you know, it wasn't, yeah, it, it, it wasn't good. that they were brilliant. I mean, yeah. so, 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 a few of them were, but it was like the ones I remember in the heart, you know, and the ones I remember for life are the ones that, that, you know, yeah, <laughs> that gave me an, another way of being with myself, essentially. Yeah. Another way of being with yourself. And you know, often coaches will ask me, like, hey, Mark, what's the one technique I should learn? You know, they're busy, right. they're trying to learn techniques. Like, you know, yeah. we've got, we got, just a quick plug, we've got an event coming up, like, top three techniques, right? And right. Let me ruin the surprise, because like, people said, what are they, what are they? And there's going to be a couple of, like, my mainstays, centering I use a lot, so I think no one would be surprised by that. The second one's another tool I use a lot that we like a lot. And the third one's kind of a trick, you know, I'm playing a dastardly trick. The third one I'm going to say is you. There's no technique. And coaches will always say, what's the one technique, the one tool? 
And I'm like, well, it almost doesn't matter what you're doing. It's your embodiment. That's what people pick up on. That the impact of that is what people remember. As you say, whether they inspired you, whether they're kind, whether they model for you something that you can grow into, like I think some of my teachers did, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And like they keep asking me for technique. And I'm like, no, no, I, I can teach a really good few techniques, but who's doing them? You know, like, is it you know, like the difference between, I don't know, the Dalai Lama teaching you centering and Gobel teaching you centering, you know, Himmler teaching you centering, right? Like, it's, it's, it's not the same. It's like, who's the person doing the centering? Who's the embodiment of that person? And it doesn't really matter what we say. You know, there's kids and dogs impacted emotionally you know when you talk to a dog it doesn't, it doesn't matter what we say about land so that's also going on for people and all the books in the world don't talk us into that so um yeah that's why we work with practices and embodiment and um i'm just kind of celebrating it was almost just like another level that kind of went went down recently i had a good break over christmas i went to a spa hotel with my wife and it was nice because it all the like fancy spas were booked up because it was last minute it was supposed to be in brazil and they changed the rules so i was like okay i mean that's this great little spa hotel it was kind of like a simple like the the sports center there was like a community sports center it wasn't like a you know, fancy gym but it was nice enough and we just had a really simple nice time and i'm like okay it kind of reset like i don't need anything fancy just nice to spend time with my wife and hotel it was chill and then I had a little kind of retreat here in Madeira, again, not in a fancy Airbnb, just in a sort of chill place. Went to a gym, kind of normal gym. It's just something about ordinariness and something that just clicked into place. And yeah, I'm enjoying it so far. Long may it last. Yeah. Wow. And, and you know, earlier you, you also said, uh, it's interesting, I mean, you added in the idea of purpose into all this because usually um, when we talk about and well-being uh, people just think okay it's you know, like meditation going to a spa or you know things like self-regulation tools but how does how does purpose fit into this <laughs> well imagine that someone you know every day ate perfectly well slept perfectly well went to the gym did their meditation had all their apps did everything perfectly but every day they went to a job that that may destroy their soul made them wasn't aligned with their values in any too way. many people was, actually I would, say, I would say a large a large percentage of the people are like this yeah but what made what would even make that worth it for me it's bizarre you know i don't know if i ever told you the story i went to the careers fair at the end of university which is like they have a big hall and all these companies there, their little stools and they're like hey come and join our graduate program you know and i walked around and it was just it just it was like globo core and nestle and you know shell or whatever and um, I cried, and I, I don't cry very often. I cry like once a year, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a proper guy, not a Californian one. So it's like, you know, like I, I walked out of there in tears because I just went, I don't want to do any of that. And then I spent seven years living out of a bag trying to find my life purpose. And mm. it's not always one thing, it's not always easy, but I think we can go, if that feels too grand for people listening, like meaningful work, right? Like authentic marketing. Yeah. like you teach right is it authentic is it meaningful is it you uh, i think we kind of know like i'm maybe more tuned into that as embodiment teacher but i don't tolerate it very much i'm not very tolerant as a person and i really don't tolerate um doing work that doesn't satisfy me you know yeah. like, and i can feel that it doesn't feel meaningful it doesn't feel like what i'm here for and when i and when i'm on it's like you strike the right chord you know on a note and that is an, that's an embodied feeling. So embodiment really helps us find that and notice when it's there, it's like a radar. And, and for me, that totally underpins health. Now, the slightly complicated thing here is it's generally very good for health. But as I said before, if your life purpose, your life purpose is almost transpersonal. And like, I'm going to speak in poetic languages. I don't really think it, like the muses don't care if you live or die. They only care that, Chopin sonata gets the you know the Moonlight Sonata gets written, right? Like the, the, they only care that Ulysses you know writes Dubliners or whatever. They, yeah. they like Ulysses gets written by James Joyce. They 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 only care that you know the the, the Ninth Symphony is finished. But they don't care about you. And again, yeah. I'm speaking metaphorically here, but so we've got to be a little perfect because the the energy of purpose. A, a little this is a little mystical, mystical, but it's transpersonal. The energy of purpose is not your energy. And it, it, this, again, this is a metaphor. So it's, 
I feel like I'm running, like you're going to Mexico soon, right? Bring, bring one of these. Because what happened was I, there was a power surge when I was in Mexico and it burnt out my laptop because I didn't have an adapter, right? Because of just the normal plug I was using. Uh, like, like the, the, I feel like life purpose is like that. It's going to be like a power surge and it can fry your wiring. Like I can yeah. stay up all night designing one of my embodiment courses in some ways, I have to have the discipline is saying no to life. <laughs> so this is huge. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I every creative person has experienced that. Um, it's like, I mean, this is why a lot of people go, well, I, I, I create. I mean, on the flip side, I can say I create when the inspiration strikes. Yeah. And to me, I'm like, well, okay, if the inspiration strikes at 3 a.m., which is what a lot of people do, inspiration strikes at 3 a.m. or if you're asleep, you're right in the middle of sleep, you're supposed to, what, get up, you know, do <laughs> yeah. the thing. And then what, you, the rest of your day's schedule is... Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, embodiment terms, there's always a balance between regulation and expression right. of flow and discipline. That's good. Like, I, I have a house of colleagues near here, right? who are, they're my new friends in Madeira. They're a house of artists. There's a lot of fucking flow in their household. Nothing starts on time. There's always arguments. They're really just amazing creative people, like such cool people. But there's not much discipline. You know, equally, when I'm in the gym, I'm around a lot of guys who are super disciplined. They're eating their chicken and, you know, broccoli and boiled rice and brown rice every day. You know, they're in there religiously. I see them the same time every day. And it's like, I don't think they dance much, you know, like they, they don't have much flow, they don't have much freedom. Like, I'm not sure if they could just say, fuck it, I'm eating a Snickers today, you know? Um, and, and that balance between flow and freedom, they're, they're, that's personal, cultural, political, and practice based. So you're a combination that it was mostly the result of those four things. So if you're a, you know, a conservative in the Midwest who does martial arts, who's um you know personally inclined towards more disciplined personality you're going to be very one-sided compared to you know a californian who personally happens to be more liberally inclined because of personality factors whose trauma means that they can't be disciplined you know as opposed to trauma means they have to be disciplined who you know just see what i mean whose practice is five rhythms and not ashtanga yoga I spoke to a German girl yesterday who's doing a lot of Ashtanga yoga. She's like, why am I not developing my flowing free feminine side when I'm doing the exact same form every morning? And I'm like, well, I'm not saying Ashtanga yoga is bad. For people like me, it's probably quite good. They're all over the place, you know? But for this person, she, she's just smart. Let me show you. She really got it. She was like, oh, okay. So I'm a German businesswoman and I'm doing a really yang formal practice every morning. Ah, she was smart enough to get it. So this is why with embodiment, different students need different things. This is the art of coaching people with embodiment. You can't just be like, right, everyone should do a sangha or everyone should do far rhythms or yeah, everyone should do good. whatever. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, it's really good. And and so just to, to circle back to what how we started the conversation, I mean, you mm. essentially the past year have been giving into the muse. Um, I mean, in, in just, you know, the embodiment cause essentially was what you were giving yourself over to, right? Well, it was a mixture of quite a potent cocktail of the muse, but while simultaneously I was seduced by um, the, you know, the temptations of the Christ. You know, I was That's seduced right. by, yeah. I'm gonna, again, I'm going to switch into Christian language now. Yeah. I was seduced by the temptations of money and power and yeah. You know, like this, these parables in the Bible of seeing the world put before you and yes. uh, you can be a big deal and you right. get recognized a few times in the street and all of a sudden the ego goes to the roof. And I'm like, oh my God, I had a two out of a hundred. Let's say a hundred is the queen or like, um, I don't know, like um, Europe's most famous footballer comes from this island. Um, or I don't know who would be there, Shaquille O'Neal or someone, right? Like that would, that would be like a hundred on the scale. And if I went to a two and it almost it almost got me and I, I i would say fame is the most toxic um money is you know can be better handled um you know being a boss a certain amount of power this kind of thing so with a mixture of sort of temptation to use an old-fashioned word um worldly wins the buddhists would say um and also sort of pseudo life purpose you know um, that was in there dressed up as that 
than I thought I was going into my life purpose and actually I was deviating away from it, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And, and so this year's focus is kind of bring the purpose forefront uh, as connected to your wellness. And because you know that what you're, what you're doing in terms of your wellness is affecting your, your audience and your clients and your team. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Like I want yeah. to be a nice boss. I want to be like a decent husband. I want to be, you know, there for my niece and not the exhausted uncle. And I also just, you know, and people often miss this one. And even without any of that service and being a good boss or whatever, you know, doing a better embodiment session, of course, but even without any of that, I want to be well. Yeah. And that's enough. I don't need a justify. I don't want to be well to do something. Yeah. It's enough. Right. It's enough to say I want to be well. The, that's it's not that's, like, it's awesome. That's, yeah. this, is, this is a good way. I want to end the conversation on that. So before we hang up, I just want to uh, give you a chance to, to share about um, the certification program that's coming up and yep. really and anything else that's, that's major that's coming up. Yeah, if people are interested in embodiment, just Google it. Stuff will come up, you know, free podcasts, books on Amazon. You know, you the embodiment stuff, podcast. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll put the link below for sure. Yeah, um, as well, we do some marketing stuff, but also just, yeah, like YouTube, it's free stuff. But, you know, like for years now, I've trained trainers, like 10 year training trainers. You know, I'm getting back to what I love. I'm getting back to what is kind of core stuff for me. And um, we're running our certification in embodiment coaching again. Uh, we do a free event as a lead up to that, which is, is pretty soon actually. Uh, so hopefully people will hear this before before that. Uh, people go to embodimentunlimited.com, company name embodimentunlimited.com. There's a bunch of free stuff there. There's a bunch of things people can see, like the different events. And um, yeah, as I said, if people are interested, they can get a taste of the free stuff and see if they want it. And our style is not for everyone. It tends to be very practical. And lots of rude jokes and lots of sense of humor. And, you know, most of all, just that sort of, you know, effective pragmatism is a big part of what we do. If people like that style, then they should check it out. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, and, and, the, and the people you gather are really awesome. Um, so, yeah. Oh, it's a great group. I mean, Patricia, yeah. who I train with a lot from Mexico, or, you know, yeah. Steve, you know well, I think now. Yes. And then, yes. um, you know, Christina, there's a whole bunch of trainers. I mean, we have really yeah. high standards and we're all, very different in, in our style i yeah. try and not make it a cult personality because it doesn't serve anyone yeah and yeah. If, if people see this with different teachers that have shared principles but very different styles different cultures etc i think you know the multicultural aspect of what we do is, is quite unique yeah. and you know most companies will have like a bunch of americans of you know different right. colors and yeah. we'll, we'll we'll have like a hungarian and a mexican and a german and you know you know really like really much more much more broad yeah. Yeah. Um, i love them you know me i love the cultural stuff i'm obsessed with that so, yeah George, man, it's, it's always a pleasure talking with you and it's always nice to see you looking well like I, yeah. do you feel like you're, you're someone who like has nailed this in like as well it looks like tell me if i'm wrong but you, you like you don't look like you're chasing the dollar too hard you don't look like you're pushing to anything you just kind of chill doing what you do you're making a good living you see yeah. every time i see you seem healthy happy <laughs> like what's your secret man <laughs> tell everyone how you, how you say well I, I'm, I, think I'm, I think i'm i think i think i think you're giving words to the kinds of stuff that i uh maybe luckily stumbled into you know like you're you're giving words to it and you're training people to do this kind of stuff and uh i think you know i maybe i've past life or whatever <laughs> tons of embodiment work in the past life <laughs> followed me here <laughs> you always say heart connected to what you care about yeah. i don't see you striving harder than is wise but equally yeah. i don't see you kind of you know you consistently show up your yeah. business you're not lazy right you're disciplined yeah, in a way which yeah, is yeah. gentle yeah yeah it's like, like you strike it's a nice like balance, that, so. but but that is but that yeah that's right the balance is what we're all going for that's a flow and discipline i really like how you how you put that so Mark, I mean, thank you. you. a little bit of crack. <laughs> yeah, just, no, I'm making it up. I'm making it up. George is the only one not on drugs in California, as far as I can tell from yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, George, a pleasure, man. Wishing, wishing you well. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark.